Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet for three years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. Yep. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. No, it cannot. Yeah. So let's start podcast number 65 Beyond Atkins with Dr. Eric Westman. So, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week? Uh, last week was uh, fasting for 46 days with Ron Coleman, mm-hmm. and I we haven't had any corrections so far, but if we get any, we will let you know. Certainly. And we're very proud of Ron and what he did. Um, I, I just find listening to people talk about their experiences fasting is motivating, yeah. uh, you know, just right now. I just, wow, I don't feel like eating for a while. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually just came off a fast, so uh, you might want to ask me about that when you ask me what happened to me this week. <laughs> okay, well, Richard, how was your week? <laughs> Not so subtle meatball uh, there. Yeah, I had a good week, actually. I fasted, uh, and then I, uh, I fasted for three days mm. uh, last week, and then I uh, went back to eating to satiety, for about three days, and then one day I just forgot to eat, and I woke up the next day and thought, I think I might fast again because I've already fasted for one day by forgetting not to eat. Uh, and so I fasted for another three days, and uh, I, f- I finished that fast at 66 hours with some bone broth earlier today. Nice. And then about four hours l- after that, uh, Julie and I went out to dinner with Louise and her mum, Louise Reynolds, one of our admins, and we had Korean barbecue, which was basically they they uh, put a barbecue plate in the middle of the table yeah. and they bring you out a tray of raw meat all sliced up finely and you just put it onto the barbecue tray and eat it when it's done to your personal croissant. Wow. And uh, it, was, it was the most keto meal that you could get at a restaurant, I reckon. Wow, that's awesome. I used to love Korean barbecue and uh, Mongolian barbecue as well. Oh yeah, that too. Yeah, on a, on a shield they have that on a, on a on a giant shield over the top of a fire. Right. Well, that's the theory, but you know, you go to most Mongolian places, they've got some sort of commercially built thing from a yeah, from yeah. some industrial. Well, they industry. use these big sticks to uh, mix up everything that you you pick from, like almost like a salad bar, but it's like a yeah. topping bar, you know meats right. and vegetables and stuff, and then they just put it all together and stir fry it and hand it to you. Boy, that's good stuff. That's a good restaurant that you can go to if you're keto because you get to choose exactly what's going to go into that meal. Right. Um, it, bring it along to the dude with the shield and yeah. <laughs> and the long pointy sticks, yep. and he'll cook your keto meal for you. Yeah. <laughs> so how was your week, Carl? My week was great. I, I feasted mm-hmm. all week nice. and uh, was able to put the wedge under the, the rock, so to speak, mm. as you yeah. know from our- Because it was all keto. All keto. Yeah. And, uh, you know, things happened with kids, kids coming home, wanting to eat this and that, wanting to go out to dinner. So I just decided, yeah, I'll just eat for a while. And then today, um, which is Saturday, the 29th of April, I just spontaneously yeah. decided, okay, it's the fasting time. I don't have anything on the yeah. calendar. 
and uh, you know, no social events to worry about. So I'm just going to do that. So it's great. Nice. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, you know, it's a really good uh, pattern that I'm getting into. I don't want to get too used to it, I guess. So right. uh, I'm going to keep changing it up and and make sure that my body is on its toes and and ready to deal with whatever I throw at it. Me too. Well, Richard, let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Yeah, it's uh, under 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. Yep. Protein uh, scales with your body mass. So if you have, uh, uh, if your lean body mass is 100 kilos, then you want one gram, one to 1.5 grams per kilo. So you want between 100 grams and 150 grams of uh, of protein a day. Yeah. And where are you going to get all your energy from? Who are you going to call? Fat. fat. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful fat. Yeah. Well, that's it, and it's to satiety, fat to satiety. So, yeah. um, you know, the, the the there's this meme going around on the internet that uh, oh, all these keto people talking about high fat food, they're going to eat too much fat. If you eat fat to satiety, it is d- by definition impossible to eat too much fat. If you're not hungry, stop eating. That's it. You know, it's not going anywhere. You can stop and test to see if you're still hungry and wait. You know, usually satiation happens after you stop eating, Yeah, right? that's right. So if you wait until you're nauseated, you're going to be really hurting for a while. Yeah, you'll be past the limit and you might not eat then for for maybe you know, half a day, a day, mm. you know. Uh, for quite some time, certainly yep. several meals. If you've if you've pushed yourself too far in one meal, then skip a couple of meals. But you know, mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, uh, it, it's eating to satiety is the method of the ketogenic diet. And if you right. go to any of the presentations by Dr. Finney, there's a couple a couple on YouTube. Every time when people say how much fat do you eat a day, he says, "I don't know." Yeah. I eat to satiety, right, you know? I eat until and I'm that'll full. be different every day. Right. Yeah, and I have no macro. I have no macro for fat. Right. I, I I limit my carbohydrate. I make sure I get enough protein, and I get all my energy from fat. And I stop when I'm no longer hungry. Yeah, and probably the easiest way to do that is to eat fatty foods, right? That contain sure. both fat and protein. Yeah. In a good ratio, and mm. then you know when you're not hungry anymore, just stop. Yeah, a lot of people on the ketogenic forum have asked us, how do we do this fat to satiety stuff? And and I generally say, you know, if you have a lean meat, make a fatty sauce with it. Right. And then eat it eat Together. it with that fatty sauce. And you can use the fatty sauce then to determine how much fat you're going to have in a diet. And a lot of cases, I mean, with Julie and I, we have different metabolisms. We need different amounts of food. And so being able to choose how much mayonnaise or how much hollandaise mm. or bernaise sauce we're going to add to our meal enables us to each individually dial up the amount of uh, fat for, for our, our own requirements. I'm finding that if I eat a ribeye, oh, yeah. I'm leaving the round lean part in the middle usually on the plate and you know people are astonished you know when they cut yeah. waiter or waitresses come back <laughs> you, miss a good you want to you want a bag for that no, sorry no i don't have a dog no. sorry <laughs> you need a dog dude you need a dog <laughs> <laughs> then i can't have xylitol well anyway oh, that's true <laughs> well before we get into the next section which is mail we need to talk about keto fest because yeah. this is the first time we've actually announced Besides the bumper last week, right. that we made our goal and then some. Congratulations, Carl. Congratulations, Richard. <laughs> yeah, we've got a keto fest. We've got a keto fest. We went over. We went over budget. That's right. Uh, almost uh, forty six thousand uh, dollars. Right. Um, we needed forty thousand minimum to be able to stage the event. Yeah. And now all of the hard work happens, really, doesn't it? Yeah, we've got uh, the speakers all figured out and booked. Yeah. And those speakers are. Uh, you and I are going to do the keynote. Yeah. We got Jeffrey Gerber. We have. Megan Ramos, Dave Feldman, Amber O'Hearn, mm-hmm. Eric Westman, Nasha Winters, yes. who we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Moore, Ivor Cummins. And then, of course, we're going to try to do a live podcast, time permitting, as well yeah. during uh, the mid- midday. With a panel of all of our experts. So right. We've also announced that on Friday, we've added an extra event. That's right. Which is a heel care uh, event that is run by uh, Dr. Westman's team. We're going to hear all about that in just a few minutes. Yeah, that's right. And and 
And then we also have a uh, and we have the VIP party. So if you were lucky enough during the Kickstarter to have uh, gotten onto the VIP party, that that sold out very quickly. Mm-hmm. And that's at Carl's place. And uh, we know what we're going to cook. We're going to keep it a secret. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. We might have a big reveal. We might have a big reveal closer to the event. Let me uh, just say, but- it used to walk on four legs. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. And it's still delicious. It's still delicious. <laughs> <laughs> right. So for any of those people who, quote unquote, purchased a ticket via pledge to Kickstarter, yep. now's the time to go get your hotel room. Yeah. Um, They'll sell out quickly. Yeah. We weren't able to really negotiate any rates um, other than a few for a few VIPs. But um, so just go find what you can. Uh, and And for those who haven't yet purchased a ticket and want to, the URL ketofest.com will very soon be taking you to a, a, an event website where you can get tickets. Also, the tickets for Eric Westman's thing will be on that page on a separate link. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll they'll be a little bit more expensive than the Kickstarter um, uh, tickets were. Not, Not by much. a lot. Yeah. Uh, but all of the Kickstarter uh, sponsors... Uh, we'll get a co-founder T-shirt, right? In recognition of the fact that you guys are co-founders of this, you you basically help get us over the line financially, so that we could actually do this. Correct. So, in short, Keto Fest is on. We're making history in New London, Connecticut. Hope you can make it. Yeah. And uh, just be watching ketofest.com or be listening to. Uh, I would say by next week we'd probably be online, but who knows? We may have snags. We'll yeah. see. Just keep listening. Hey, Carl, you know we're justified. Yeah, and we don't need no alibi. No, let's mail or get out of the way. <laughs> Time for mail! mail! We're justified and we don't need no alibi. That might work. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, All right, we never said we were comedians. No. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. This is a simple one. It's uh, just a little post from Scatter mm. in the forum. That's uh, this person's nickname. And this is in the feasting, fasting cycle thread. Right. And Scatter says, ended my 72-hour fast at 219 pounds, up to 221 after three days of feasting, and my pre-fast feast cycling with two cycles completed was 234. Nice. So Scatter is really seeing a dramatic improvement. In body weight at least, yeah. In body weight at least, right, exactly. And I found also just... Even in the last few days of feasting, people have noticed that I look thinner than I did last week. Excellent. And you know, I've I've heard it now from three people, mm. which I don't usually hear. I don't usually hear, wow, you're looking even better than the last time I saw you. <laughs> right. So yeah. I don't know, you know, there must be some magic in that fasting stuff mm. and just as much in the feasting. I'm going to continue doing it. Yeah. Well, as long as it feels good. Um, yeah. And I certainly feel great doing it. So, yeah. yeah. So I've got a mail here from Keto Kate, and this is also from the forum. Okay. Uh, And this is uh, titled, What to Expect When You Take a Break from Keto. Ooh. And uh, Kate says, there's plenty of information on the web and throughout various categories on the ketogenic forum about getting started on keto and the dreaded carb withdrawal or keto flu that accompanies the first few days of making the change to this way of eating. Harder to find is information on what to expect if you take a break from keto. We've all had difficult moments throughout our lives where our best intentions can go by the wayside, an extended holiday, a broken heart, a stressful period at work. Yeah. All of this can lead to relaxing key elements of keto, a slippery slope indeed. Long story short, I made the decision to take a break from keto about six weeks ago. Uh, Now, don't get me wrong, it wasn't a hard and fast decision. Rather, I took what I thought was going to be a quick trip uh, along a well-worn and known path and instead turned into a more casual meandering down memory lane. Mm. (laughs) Let me explain. I had a busy period at work comprising 16-hour days, seven days a week for a few weeks, and for the most part, I stuck to keto with the exception of the odd meal here and there. Mm. When I was tired and I just couldn't be bothered prepping or cooking or finding keto-friendly food, I reintroduced some old favorites into my diet, like the occasional piece of bread or some hot chips, and was pleasantly surprised that they didn't taste nearly as good as I remembered them Mm. tasting. Mm. So there was no risk of the old habits becoming new again, right? 
<laughs> That's <laughs> foreshadowing right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> there it is, <laughs> right? <laughs> ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. After all, work would settle down soon and I'd be back on track again. Right? 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 (laughs) (laughs) The busy period of work was then followed by a visit from dear friends who came to stay with us. It was their first trip to Australia and we filled it with koala and fairy penguin encounters. Time at the beach, soaking up the sun from a wonderful extended summer and, of course, obligatory sampling of Melbourne's cafe culture delights. Mm. A few more old faves danced over my tongue during this time. Chocolate, biscuits, ice cream, etc. Mm. Again, I was pleasantly surprised that they didn't taste nearly as good as I remembered them tasting. Mm. So there was no risk of old habits becoming new again. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. After all, our visitors would soon go home and I'd be back on track again. Right? Right. <laughs> um, not sure. Okay. okay. Stay tuned. So back to work I go. A household that had been so recently packed with four adults, three teenagers and a dog was back to being a sanctuary for this quiet couple and their beloved pet. Thankfully, I was also greeted by a quiet week in the office, which gave me time to decompress and recover from these crazy few weeks. I was mm. tired, not just from the recent frenzy of activity, uh, though that was not a significant contributor. I didn't really enjoy eating food that wasn't keto. Mm. Nothing I ate during that time tasted as good as a memory or the feeling it invoked. Yeah. So there was no risk of old habits becoming new again, right? <laughs> I'm sensing that. <laughs> saw here. here. <laughs> <laughs> My original intent was to take a more relaxed approach to keto for a period of two weeks for the time I knew I was going to be busy and sources of food w- would be unpredictable. So what actually happened, I woke up this past weekend and realized that two weeks had actually turned into six. Ooh. I was tired, bone tired. I felt tired in a way that I hadn't felt tired for over six months. And I ached. My joints ached, my back, my knee, my feet hurt. And this combined with a flare-up of old plantar fasciitis and hip bursitis had me rolling out of bed every morning like a 90-year-old. I I ached in a way that I hadn't ached for over six months. Wow. I felt ill. I was bloated and puffy. Reflux was keeping me up at night. Skin tags were starting to reappear along with dark circles under my eyes. My bowel was irritable, and quite frankly, so was I. I felt ill in a way that I hadn't felt ill for over six months. Wow. I overate. My appetite increased, slowly at first, but then quite rapidly, the more I reintroduced non-keto foods. I miss keto, eating nutrient-rich food that fills both tummy and soul, not having to take medication on a daily basis to keep the symptoms of metabolic disease at bay, feeling in control of my appetite, my health, my life. I miss keto and all of the accompanying benefits I had experienced over the previous six months. Mm. Upon reflection, everything I discussed above really doesn't come as a great surprise, perhaps with the exception of just how easy it was for me to fall back into old eating patterns. What was surprising, though, was that throughout my six-week break, I craved all of the things that were keto. Mm. I craved steak in a way that was greater than any craving that I had ever had for sugar and carbs during my initial two weeks of adjusting to the ketogenic diet. Wow. Don't worry, I'm not going to go on and lecture you about following to a strict ketogenic diet, nor am I going to club you over the head with the wonders of a ketogenic lifestyle. Mm. After all, you're here on the forums because you've come to that realisation on your own. I'm simply sharing this experience to demonstrate how easily a little nibble on garbage here and there combined with a little break in the keto mindset now and then can snowball from a snack to a meal to a day to a week and so on. So what can you do if you find yourself in a similar situation? First and foremost, I'd suggest that you find a way to continue with keto. If, however, like me, you learn this lesson the hard way, go back to the basics. Eat less than 20 grams of net carbohydrates a day, one to one and a half grams of protein per kilo of lean body mass and Mm. fat to satiety every day. Yeah. Drink plenty of water uh, and allow your body to sleep as your body recovers. Donate any remaining non-keto food to a local food bank or homeless shelter or or hide it or throw it away. Don't be so cruel to the homeless, though. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Life's tough for them already. Don't give them carbs. I tell you what's a signal for me when I find myself becoming the mayor of Excuses Village. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, oh, well, you know, well, this won't hurt because of that. You know, well, I, you know, whatever. The things that you tell yourself. Right. You're not telling yourself from a place of rational thought. I mean, you're rationalizing things. You're making a rationalization. Yeah. Yeah. You're making a rationalization fit because you're having a craving. Right. Which is beyond your control. And so, of course, we like to feel in control. So we like to think, oh, I meant to do that. Right. And here's why. So. Yeah. Yeah, and and my go-to therapy for getting off the keto wagon 
is to start the day with three eggs cooked in butter or bacon fat, a whole bunch of bacon. Mm, That's going to quell my hunger until probably even dinner time now. I mean, you know, now that you've been doing it for a long time, it doesn't take but one meal of bacon and eggs in the morning to quell your hunger and uh, satisfy you. And the next thing I eat is going to be a big fat ribeye smothered in butter. I mean, that is not suffering, people. No, and already you're 24 hours into keto again. Right. Yeah, and then just start the next day with bacon and eggs again because who doesn't like bacon and eggs? Who doesn't two like days bacon and eggs? Have another one. <laughs> exactly. Have four. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, have some avocado with it. Have some it's avocado. Delicious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and if bacon and fried eggs gets boring, have bacon and scrambled eggs. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not that hard. And you know you can make Brenda Zorn's waffles because they're just they're just pig skin and eggs. Right. <laughs> so yeah, delicious. On the line, we have Dr. Eric Westman. Welcome, Dr. Westman. Thank you. We are so excited to have you, and this is the first time you've been on our show. But a lot of people don't really know, maybe uh, maybe our audience does, but I think uh, a lot of people need to know your creds, know your history in the low-carb world, and it has to do with Dr. Atkins, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, yeah, at the very very beginning, um, I visited Dr. Atkins to see what he was doing because a couple of my patients here in Durham, North Carolina, were following that diet and and actually doing really well. So I went up to kind of check out what he was doing, kick the tires, so to speak, and was favorably impressed. impressed. But I didn't start doing it. I I was impressed enough to ask him for money to do some research. Sure. So the method we use is heavily influenced by Dr. Atkins and the method that he had used for about 30 years in New York City. But uh, yeah, I met, met him, you know, just when I was ready to really kind of pick his brain about what was going on, he died on unti- an untimely death, yeah. slipping on the ice in New York City. Right. So uh, that was 2003. And, you, and if you think about that, that was, that was 14 years ago. Right. The, the knowledge, a lot of the knowledge that Dr. Atkins had is wrapped up in the brain of Jackie Everstein, hmm. the nurse who worked with Dr. Atkins for 30 years. And she's uh, been a good friend and now a member on a team, a company that we're starting. So, um, but yeah, that was my Dr. Atkins brush with fame. A lot of the scientific community kind of brushed him aside because he didn't feel he needed to do the science because he had such clinical uh, evidence of his patients. He claimed to have cured, what, 50,000 patients or more with of type 2 diabetes, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it was it's kind of sad to see that disconnect the academic world you know called them quacks and you know and um he actually was a, a pretty solid internal medicine cardiologist who was just reading a paper in a medical journal and followed up on it then what happened was the medical academic world went up in an entirely different direction saying eating fat was bad mm. and it even got to the point where i'm told people saw him on the streets in new york city they would go to the other side of the street on the sidewalk to not be near him. So, um, but as Jackie Everstein says, and, and what really, you know, gets me motivated to do this despite the widespread acceptance is you see people getting better every day. And, right. and so you, it's hard to, um, hard to uh, not acknowledge when you're in a clinic seeing it every day. I was just trolling through YouTube today at looking through old videos uh, about low carb stuff and I ran into a USDA great debate between Dr. Atkins and Dr. Ornish. And Dr. Westman was on there, very young Dr. Westman. And I think you were just um, uh, presenting for the first time some real credible science underpinning Dr. Atkins' work. Yeah. So that, <laughs> looking back, um, that was the first public um, presentation of information in uh, 50 people over six months with what Dr. Atkins was prescribing or, or doing. And, you know, looking back, it, it, it's not sufficient to change public policy. Yeah. But on that kind of debate, which was a lot of mudslinging back and forth, it was one of the only, you know, lights of, of science uh, being shown. Um, behind the scenes, one of my colleagues um, was actually going to do my slides for me, and it looks really awkward because they wouldn't let him move my slides. And and so afterwards, I go to my colleague, "What happened? Why didn't my you didn't you didn't do my slides?" He said, "You know, Eric, they wouldn't let me. I mean, there was this 
big guy with a microphone in his ear and, and or earpiece and um and you know that didn't come out till some time mm. later but um wow. So it was, that was more of a show than than really presentation of science. So let's talk about the science and the studies that you've done and your people have done. Sure. So, I mean, we're one of the two scientific centers, Jeff Volek, who used to be at University of Connecticut. He's now at Ohio State. We both approached Dr. Atkins, actually, to do science about the health effects. So everyone knew it could work, but everyone said it would kill you. So right. the remaining question really was, is, it, is this really a harmful thing to do? Mm. And much to the surprise of us and, and others, it actually was a healthy thing to do, but you had to look at the information in a different way, a new yeah. way. So you had to incorporate the lipid panels, the blood cholesterol panels, and look at the triglyceride, the bad fats as well. They're, they're bad fats. It's not just LDL, the bad fat. And you had to look at the good fats, the good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. So the Volek and myself, and now studies around the world. I mean, in Australia, it's the CSIRO, mm. Manny Noakes, and Grant Brinkworth. In fact, of all the countries, uh, Australia has a, a book out from the mainstream that it's okay to do low carb. So here's to here's to you in Australia. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, Sweden has a a. Uh, so all the studies are done. They're generally not cited by people who don't believe it, even scientists who don't believe it. And, and I keep saying, well, it's not a belief. It's, it's yeah, science now. Science. You know, <laughs> some scientists who don't want to look at anyone else's science. And, well, that's, you know, one kind of scientist. That's not the way I am. So, so now, you know, when we saw the assembly of information of the science about low-carb diets or low-carb high-fat diets, LCHF, if you want to say that today, or keto, the amassed science was sufficient. It was equivalent to a drug approval at the FDA. So, so when the, the diet research got good enough that, you know, it would have been a drug approved, I started using it in a clinic. And so that's when we opened our own lifestyle medicine clinic, which really uses the low carb diet as a default or first line treatment. And so that was 10 years ago. And so I've been, after the research was done to a sufficient level, I've been using the diet in a clinical setting all right, so here's a question out of left field. How many patients have you harmed? <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, the practice of medicine is such that there are people do get harmed. I mean, just by people living. I mean, if I compared um, how many people I hurt with drugs compared to those I hurt, and, I, and I'm not talking yeah, killing. Yeah, get hurt. Like yeah. Giving a gout flare. Um, okay. Worst case, you know, having hunger and and the drama of not having their fruit. Right. But um, <laughs> so you know, really, like medically stuff, this is nowhere near the like the weight loss surgery that people do. Right. I mean, if you do that, you're accepting an operation risk. Uh, you know, some people don't get off the table, I and mean, you know, so so comparatively, um, I I to my knowledge not harmed seriously anyone right but with weight loss there are certain risks that come along with any weight loss process sure. including if you're using it for weight loss so those um you'll have the same rate of those problems as if you were using a low fat diet right and right. one of the studies we did dr yancey my colleague here at duke did compared the low carb diet to the low fat diet with orlistat but with a drug and then the drug and the diet was no better than just the diet if mm. it was low carb. Okay. You know, you have to always put, do you harm people, do you hurt people in the context of what you're trying to do medically? Um, you know, I've sent two people now to lose weight so that they could get heart transplants. Wow. You know, they, their heart was so bad, they had a pump in their heart because their heart wouldn't pump. You know, so, mm. uh, so I'm comfortable using this kind of method and people with diabetes, high blood pressure, and not just obesity, um, but of course you need special training to do that. I, I don't so, know. so let me ask you the antithesis of that question. How many people have reduced weight, uh, uh, reversed diabetes, uh, et cetera, under your care? So best I can tell, using our clinical research, which is our computer, um, that we pull information out. Over the last 10 years, we've treated about 4,000 people. 
Wow. wow. In the last five years, we've gone to a new computer system. So I have the best data over the last five years. And we treated 2,000 people and helped them lose 28,000 pounds. That's amazing. And many of these people have illnesses. Yeah. I mean, um, so, I mean, this is just a dent, right? If you read the new Atkins book, which I'm an author on, and did it on your own because you didn't have any medical problems, mm. you know, no one gets credit for that. Sure. You know? sure. And it's easy for many people. Like your story, right? Yeah. Relatively easy. You know? Yeah, it was easy and delicious. I guess what I can say from my clinical experience is that it has a safety index that it can be used in situations where doctors would can't do can't do surgery, they can't use medication. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's pretty pretty nice medical tool um, when done properly. Yeah, the CSIRO diet was interesting because uh, CSIRO is almost our version of the Na National Institutes of Health. And so uh, the deep space array that um, that um, keeps contact with uh, uh, vehicles for NASA uh, out beyond Saturn, that's all managed by the CSIRO. They've won Nobel Prizes for working out the expansion rate of the galaxy. So, you know, this is not a fly-by-night organization. And for them to come out with – they had a low-carb, a low-ish carb, low carb diet about a decade ago, the CSIRO diet, the first one. Uh, and it, but it was still very low fat. It was low, lowish carb and uh, moderate protein. But to really come out and say we think it was probably wrong, the the CSIRO diet book that was released this year comes out and says we think it was probably wrong to advise diabetics to eat a low fat diet. That's a remarkable statement. Yeah, yeah. Well, it reflects the science, which is awesome. <laughs> Not all yes. scientific organizations reflect the science or or the all of the science, you know. Right. So tell us about HEAL. Yeah, so after years of doing this in the clinic and having people wait six months to get an appointment to see me, um, you know, from the academic world, that shows how great you are, right? If people yeah. have to wait and wait. And, but then it's terrible customer service. Sure. And you can't really see many people. So um, we started a company called HEAL Clinics, or HEAL means healthier eating and living. And uh, it's a company that, that's really scaling up the teaching and training of, of people to teach people how to do low-carb diets. And it's a keto version. It, it's actually the nutritional part of HEAL is the nutrition that I've been using now for 10 years after the science has been done. Mm. But what's really nice about the HEAL clinics is that you get someone who's already done it as your partner. So you have the the person to call in a, in a moment of crisis, you have a, a contact of someone who's been in the trenches doing it themselves. So you're emphasizing telemedicine, right? Sort of like Skype availability for your coaches? Well, it's not exactly telemedicine because we don't practice medicine. We're, we're okay. coaching people, partnering with them as long as they don't have medical problems. So um, my comfort level is that if someone doesn't have medical problems, this is just healthy eating. And all they need is the instruction on how to do it, which we'll do by Skype, by, by FaceTime, by email, by, by phone, if needed. Um, the medical component, if someone has medications they're taking for blood pressure, or, so we have a screening process where if you're on a medicine that might be affected by this kind of program or any weight loss program or diet change, then you have to see someone, a trained heal practitioner in the clinic as you get trained to do it. So maybe if you have, if you're taking metformin for high blood sugar and maybe you're pre-diabetic or maybe even just recently type 2 diabetic that and not taking insulin, that would be, you'd qualify for it? Right. So if it's a, a early diabetes with one medicine that would be probably taken away as you change the diet, that is something that could be part of the non-medical portion. But it so it's kind of a judgment call by our team to say, mm. no, it looks like this, unless you're really savvy, you really need a medical person to help you do this. I'm thinking of insulin too. You, you've treated people who've taken, who are taking insulin for type 2 diabetes, right? And you've gradually lowered it. Yeah. And so the insulin needs to be adjusted very quickly. Uh, and often it needs to be reduced on the first day if the blood sugar control is really good. So we're not going to let people um, do this under our rubric uh, without face-to-face -face 
help if they're on insulin or, or if they're on me blood pressure medicines because the blood pressure really needs to be monitored because it gets better. Now, don't get me wrong. All of these things get better. But mm. in order to safely come off these medicines, we think it's important to see someone. But if you don't have a medical problem, we'll help you at a distance. Um, don't know if we have a, a client yet in Australia. Um, we'd have to work out the time, but I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah. It, it's pretty exciting to see this then being scaled up. So, you know, our, our dream is to treat not just 2,000 over five years, but, you know, 2,000 in a month, you know, uh, because there, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that need this information. I mean, so um, thanks, thanks for asking. So Heal Clinics is the, healclinics.com is the website. And I'm excited to be a part of a Heal event at Keto Fest, if you're still up for that, still down for that, I mean. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we changed our mind. No, no, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Westman and Nurse Jackie and a team of volunteers are coming to Keto Fest and doing a pre-conference event on Friday, July 14th at All Souls Unitarian Congregation on J Street in New London. And you guys will have... Uh, a, a site up where you're handling all the registrations and all that. There's 250 seats. I think you're charging 50 bucks. And we're also allowing um, local medical professionals to come for free. It's a great event. Fantastic. Well, first of all, congratulations on getting the, the Keto Fest funded. We're very excited, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm happy and you know, proud to come and, and show the heel clinics, uh, events, that, but it's not just, we're not just selling a product. We're, we're going to teach uh, and motivate. Um, what we've been able to do um, many times now is bring together people who've already had success. At the last meeting, we said anyone who's been affected come up to the front of the room, and there were 50 people. Wow. I mean, if you imagine, wow. you added up all the weight loss, you know, so we'll do that. Well, if anyone, you know, if you guys want to come up, tell your story, you, you know. That's amazing. It's, it's um participatory thing. Um, I give some of the science geekiness, but, you know, I've been told not so geeky. Not so, and so I'm, <laughs> you know, trying to articulate it in a way that the audience will understand. But, you know, if you have some doctors in the audience, you got to throw in some pretty geeky slides, right? Um, yeah. You don't want to come off as someone who's not scientific. Um, and then the motivation part of what we do for people who are not quite sure they're on the fence, they don't know. You know, the not only the stories of people, but we have motivational speakers who come in. That's um, and then um, Jackie Everstein, who's one of my teachers, she was the off nurse's office that I sat in in Dr. Atkins' clinic in 1998, is still in the game. She's our educational director, and she'll be there to give a talk and then to answer questions. So it's really a, a lineup of motivation, science. Uh, uh, to get you started, but then also if you're having trouble, you're not sure, mm. gosh, the nutritional disinformation that's out there, uh, often my job is just to keep people focused on one aspect of the, the carbs or the, the uh, getting proper nutrition. So we'll be there not only to help people who haven't started, but to help people who are on their journey, either doing great to tell their story or not great to get troubleshooting done. Um, so in some ways, you can think of it as a big support group as well, you know, male motivating great. and giving support. It's a great thing to do before a festival on keto to come and, you know, join a group of uh, and get inspired and get a bit of the science. And then we've got Social Saturday where we're all going to be doing fun keto activities. And then on Science Sunday, you'll be speaking uh, and giving a lot more of the science, right? Yes. So I'll be speaking as part of the event um, mm. later on, but we'll give you a, a you know, a taste of it as well on that Friday. You know, you can envision someone, oh, I don't know, I don't want to do it. Come on down to the Keto Fest. You get motivated, you see other advice, and then you start it on Saturday, yeah. right? Or that night, and then you have yeah. great foods. Uh, I'm told, you know, you're going to have, you know, the whole town. Well, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, a, I love the um, improvisation and artistry and just getting something like this going um, as a, uh, someone who's seeing this uh, process move along, um, that's fantastic what you're doing. And so if you haven't even started, this would be a great time to start. 
So our goal really is with Kitterfest is to leave New London better than we found it. So uh, we are trying to turn New London keto for the weekend and really our, our benchmark for that is to have at least half of the restaurants in the downtown district have at least one menu option that is ketogenic. Because the problem when you go out for a dinner is you don't know whether the meals are going to fit your macros or not and so or they have hidden carbs or whatever or they have hidden carbs or whatever yeah so but but the other thing is we want people in new london locals to be able to bring their doctors to this event to be able to introduce their family to other people on keto and to get a better comfort zone around it so that when we come back in a year's time there'll be so many more people who are doing it and it's like a It's like a a waterfall effect. I'll also add that the theme of Keto Fest is paying it forward. So the idea is let's not just keep this to ourselves, right? Uh, You're going to have a lot of people that come to you and say, what did you do? I'm interested in losing weight. But really what they want to do is get healthy and they don't even know it. And I have friends that come to me and see my success in losing weight and say, yeah, I could use it to lose a few pounds, maybe 50 pounds or whatever. I'll try that. They don't really realize until they're into it, you know, that, wow, I don't miss the carbohydrates. But in the beginning, they plan on going right back to eating what they call a balanced diet when, you know, when they reach their goal weight. But of course, you know, keto pulls the old one-two punch on you and says, oh yeah, yeah, go go ahead and try some of that bread. Try some of that stuff. A, you'll hate it. And B, you'll feel like crap. So uh, it gets you. You know, as a heads up for the um, people bringing in food for the weekend, uh, there are two situations that I've been in that um, the low carb cruise, for example, Mm. has a whole restaurant of low carbers and so you better have enough butter or are there going to be there's going to be mutiny <laughs> well <laughs> oh. and then also in a um, study that we did in north of vancouver which was documented in a documentary called my big fat diet by the canadian broadcast company the town grocer is interviewed and says cauliflower cauliflower i can't believe there's a run on cauliflower it's i saw that awesome. that yeah, was amazing dream. You had no idea if people want, would want heavy cream. You know, no one has cream. So sure, there's a butter cream. Oh, and then bacon. Yeah. I forgot about bacon. Looks like you got a yeah. handle on that one. We do. There's going to be a bacon bar. We've got it from a, a local restaurant that is used to cooking up 100 pounds of bacon at a time. Plus, there's also a restaurant depot, two of them nearby that I have access to. So, yeah, I think we're going to need more time and space to cook it all than we will have we won't run out of bacon. Can I put in an order for a uh, dark chocolate covered bacon, please? Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's I'm really awesome. looking forward to this. It, it's going to be great fun and educational for those who, who want that, too. Thank you so much for joining us, Eric. And we'll see you at Keto Fest. Thank you. See you at Keto Fest. Thanks. Well, I tell you, Richard, I can't wait for this event on Friday, July 14th, with yeah. uh, Eric and Jimmy Moore is going to be in on it. Uh, didn't mention that before. Yeah. And uh, Nurse Jackie. Wow. In my town. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Atkins Nurse in your town. And we're going to be teaching people how to be influencers. Wow. Um, so which, cool. I mean, hopefully you'll, we'll have a lot of locals. And the goal is uh, when we come back in a year's time, all of those locals will have gone out and influenced thousands more people. And so- yeah, you know, it'll be a bigger conference. It'll be uh, uh, will have made a positive effect on the town of New London, and we will have turned it turned it ketogenic, not just for for a weekend, yeah. but uh, I- I- into the future. And Richard and I have decided to open up movie night to anyone who wants to just walk in off the street and sit down and watch the movies. We've rented the theater anyway. We don't have to pay extra per head for these movies. You know, the theater holds 1,800 people, and uh, yeah, why not? So if you're coming to Keto Fest and your family have come with you and you're joining all the social Saturday of keto events because, you know, maybe they're not keto, bring them along to the movie theater. Right, exactly. And anybody who's local, you know, hopefully there will be a sign on the marquee, you know, free yeah. health movies or, you know, that kind of thing. All right, Richard, are you hungry? Yes, I've just broken my fast and I'm hungry again. Well, I got something for you. It's called Recipes! Recipes! So what you got, Carl? 
Well, I've got something really good. Uh, I used to go to this Mexican restaurant when I was eating garbage. Oh, yeah. And they used to have this Mexican chorizo queso fundido, mm. which is essentially fried crumbled chorizo, which is a pork sausage. And uh, they put cheese on top of it and various forms and maybe a little scallion or something like that. And they serve it with warm tortillas. Ah, that's the downside. Yeah, exactly. That's the downside. But I found uh, that when I ate this stuff, there was a spice in it that I couldn't figure out that was just so delicious. And I didn't know if it was Mm. cloves or or cumin or what it was. Like I couldn't identify it. And the chorizo that I was using uh, to make this at home was just the the long kielbasa-shaped chorizo. Okay. And it's dense. And you Mm. just crumble it and chop it up and fry it. And I fried it in butter. And then I would get like a can of Tostitos queso, which is really crappy cheese. But, you know, it's that cheese whiz mixed with a little jalapeno. And you you just pour that in there. And, you know, everybody loved it at home. And this was before keto. Mm. So I would serve it with tortilla chips. And the kids loved it. I loved it. Everybody loved it. So- now I'm keto. I'm, I kind of miss that. Yeah. So I found at the grocery store Mexican chorizo mm-hmm. that comes in a package that looks more like ground beef. Really? Yeah. So it's, it's already crumbled up. It's ground. And not just crumbled, oh, wow. it's ground. So essentially mm. when you make it, it, it looks like ground hamburger, right? Which is great. Oh, sure. And it also mm. had a little bit of that flavor. And I identified what it is. It's Chinese five spice powder. Of course, yes. Which is weird yeah, because Mexican no, no, chorizo with Chinese five spice powder, trust me, that is the secret to making really yeah. good fried chorizo. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because like, I really love the, the flavor of lup chong, which is Chinese sausage that's made with uh, Chinese five spice. Ah. Obviously, somebody who agrees with me has said, hey, why don't we c- combine chorizo with five spice yeah. and you get like that sort of You can't uh, really describe it. I, yeah, it's peppery, chorizo, but, it, but it's- And then, uh, right. Ah. Lovely. So good. That. <laughs> yeah. And for the my first attempt to do this queso failed, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, mm-hmm. I didn't drain the fat out. And so when you're trying to make a creamy cheese sauce, right. having, you know, unincorporated blobs of oil yeah uh isn't too appetizing no. even though you know fat is good and mm. all that stuff it was delicious but i also use the sodium citrate trick to sure. make cheese sauce and the problem with that is it coagulated too much it didn't really make a creamy sauce right so the next one i'm going to do is going to be more like a bechamel in other words i'm sure. going to have heavy cream and simmer that and then sprinkle in my cheese, and for my cheese, I use Monterey Jack and a mild cheddar. Mm. And then I'm going to use some a little bit of xanthan gum just to thicken it up a little bit. Yeah, that makes More sense. More like you'd use cornstarch or flour in a sure. bechamel, right? Yeah. And then, of course, you add a little jalapeno, a little tomato, whatever spice you want there to give it a kick. Drain the chorizo, mix it all together, and then eat it as a dip with pork rinds. Mm. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> That's a party dip right there. Yeah, yeah. We're having absolutely. a keto party. We sure are. <laughs> so I've got a recipe today. It's uh, it's actually from the forum. It's from somebody called Candrac. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the recipe goes, it's basically chicken skin as a wrap. Wow. And uh, Candrac says, I just saw a recipe for fried chicken egg rolls where the author used chicken skins as the egg roll wrapper. Although I haven't had the opportunity to make this recipe yet, but she includes the recipe on the Oh, that the, sounds the so post. good. Yeah. Uh, it got me wondering at all the possibilities. I cook a lot of chicken every week for meals and for dog food, and so I always have a lot of skin. I usually leave the skin on while cooking the chicken and then eat some while it's hot with salt or save it to fry for a fat bomb. So I'm wondering what other things could I wrap in chicken skin? I'm thinking oh. taquitos with chicken oh. uh, and cheese dipped in guacamole would be awesome. Oh, my. Yeah. I also make a chicken roll that I wrap in bacon and bake, so I'm thinking I could use chicken skin instead. Uh, so we actually use chicken skin here uh, when when we cook a whole chook. Yeah. Uh, Julie pulls the skin off beforehand 
Uh, and so we end up with a, a, a massive big piece of chicken skin. And what we do is we put it between two pieces of baking paper between two cookie trays yeah. and put it in the oven and bake it. Keep it flat. And it ends up becoming like, yeah, it's still got some of the fat underneath mm-hmm. the skin, so it ends up becoming like chicken crackling. Right. You need to salt it nicely, maybe put some chicken salt on it. You probably don't need to put chicken salt on because it's already chicken flavored. And so when you cook and the whole chicken without the skin on, how do you keep it from drying out? Do you put it in an oven oh, bag or something? Well, no, we'll 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 put it in a pot. We'll basically okay. cooking cooking a stew or something like that. Oh, so yeah. so um, before jointing the chicken and to put in a meal, mm. we'll pull the skin off and put it in the, in the oven to bake. Wow. But this idea of wrapping, I mean, you could wrap uh, spring rolls. Yeah. In uh, in chicken skin, um, there's there's lots of things you could do. So uh, maybe pot stick. Uh, you could make pot stickers, or you could make. Um, Money bags, Thai money bags with uh, chicken skin. One of my favorite dumplings that I used to make with my kids was simply chopped uh, fried mushrooms, onions, peppers, and goat cheese. Oh. And sort of, you know, in garlic. In a spring roll wrapper. Well, it was in a wonton wrapper at the time. But I imagine something just with a lot of dense flavor like that, you know, some really pungent mushrooms. Maybe not yeah. onions and peppers because those get old after a while, but maybe some garlic, some mushrooms, some goat cheese, maybe yeah. some pork rinds for a little texture, you know, crushed pork Ooh, rinds. Yeah. And then you could you could uh, pull it together in a bag and maybe put a scallion around the outside oh, of it to, oh, wow. to, to tie up the bag and make a little money bag, dip it in in a uh, deep fryer and uh, fry it and uh, that's a great idea yeah i think i think i'm going to i think that's giving me some ideas but uh, we're going to put a link in the show notes mm-hmm. uh, taking you to uh, Kendra's, uh thread and uh, please yep. if you come up with any ideas of how to use chicken skin as a wrap throw them in and that's a wrap richard <laughs> <laughs> speaking of wraps <laughs> Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 dudescom or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 dudes, on Instagram at 2 dudes, and make sure to use the hashtag 2 dudes. And of course, if you want to join our forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, you know, t-shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.2keto.com. And now you can join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be yeah. eligible to win something in every show. And if you feel like supporting our podcast and our forums, hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. You can also see our podcast and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a great review on iTunes. Absolutely. Well, keep calm and keto on, buddy. And keep calm and keto on, Carl. All right. We'll see you next time. On Two Keto Dudes. dudes.